Once I was lost, wandering in darkness, no life inside, no hope inside. He called my name and healed my blindness, sent me a place. Now I'm alive with His love breaking through my heart and stone, love breathing to awake. This is a season for a new anointing. This is a season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of glory may arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for His pleasure all creation sings. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now rise and shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now rise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory fill the earth. 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 As we declare, this is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. King of glory, King of glory, fill the earth. King of glory, fill the earth. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Description to marvelous for words, to wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. And who can grasp your infinite wisdom? And who can fathom the depth of your love? Majesty, now majesty, enthroned above, and I stand, I stand in all of you, I stand, I stand in all of you, holy God to whom all praise is due, and Lord I stand in Sing the chorus again. And I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. 
holy God, to whom all praise is due. And Lord, I stand in awe of you, a holy God, and a holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. God, we do that. We do that in our hearts. We do that in our living rooms. We do that in our tiny churches. We are in awe of you, Father. We pray that we will bless you as we sing and as we make this joyful noise within our hearts and our lives. And that, Father, we would make a difference, that we choose to make a difference in the world today by the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way that we interact even on social media, Father. We pray your blessing. We pray for your guidance. We pray for your spirit to lead us, Father. We love you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? And why did he choose a lowly bird? God loves with an unfair kind of love. And I sure am thankful. Let's look at Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43, Jesus says, You've heard it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Catch this. He, your Father in heaven, causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Your Father in heaven, He sends His Son to bless the crops of the unrighteous and the righteous. That isn't fair. And I am glad because I am unrighteous. Again, on the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 35, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. 
He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked? Good news for me. Because I'm ungrateful and wicked. Are you ever ungrateful? Jesus is teaching us about God's nature. About God's way. He's not asking us to do something that God doesn't do. God, he is teaching us about God's way. God loves His enemies. Which is also good news for us. Because we were once God's enemies. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says this. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. And so we run to His table. We run to this table, the communion table, with gratitude in our hearts. Because God is so generous to us despite our spiritual poverty. We take the cup and we take the bread and together we draw near to God and we pray. Father in heaven, your name, your name is the one that should be revered and reverenced and said in whispered tones. Your name should be famous and not my name. Father, your kingdom is the only one that's real. The kingdoms of this earth come and go, and the kingdom in, of mine only exists in my imagination. I have no kingdom other than yours. Your kingdom come. Father, your will be done. Father, let my will dissolve like an Alka-Seltzer in the ocean. I surrender my will. I have no will other than yours. Your will be done. God, give us uh, our daily bread today. We trust you to give us and provide for our needs. And so take care of us. And we'll focus our mind's energy on serving you. God, forgive us because we are ungrateful. Forgive us our many sins and transgressions as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Father, lead us through temptation. We know that you want us to be in the presence of people, and so we're going to be exposed to evil, but, but lead us through it as we go. And finally, Father, it is your kingdom, uh, your power, and your glory. Those are the only things that matter. And so we, uh, we pledge to give our energy, to spend our lives helping those things to grow. Your power, your kingdom, your glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you as you take the bread and the cup. Amen. Just a reminder of the various ways that you can give. And let me also encourage you, if you're able and healthy, to give of your time this week. Pray with me over the offering. Father, you do provide for all of our needs as you have promised. You clothe us just like the flowers of the field. And you feed us just like you do the birds of the air. And we are thankful. We are thankful. Help us to, uh, to gladly and with a joyful heart give back uh, part of what you've given to us as a symbol of, uh, of our faith in you. God bless us as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, PV and guests. We are so glad you're worshiping with us today. While we continue to worship online, we want you to know that plans are in place for another outdoor service. All that information will be available soon, so just please stay tuned to your email and our social media. In the meantime, it is never too late to join a tiny church. Groups are meeting all over Little Rock, in Maumel, North Little Rock, and even Conway. Seven people have asked, are these the same as life groups? Are they new? Will they continue to meet or could they continue to meet after we come back to the building? The simplest answer to all these questions is yes. Uh, these groups uh, are very similar to life groups, but they're very intentional about taking communion together. So there is a new element and they would be a great thing to continue as we come back to the building and be a part of our church family, helping us be stronger together. So if you are not in a tiny church, or if your tiny church is meeting but you haven't let the office know, please give us a call or email this week.
Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us here at Pleasant Valley, especially if you're a guest. And members, I know what you're thinking and probably a lot of you who are guests who have been joining us online are thinking, you're not Jonathan Stormont. You're right, I'm not. Jonathan is on a two-week study break right now, getting prepared for future sermons, future lessons. And man, I don't know about you, but I'm very thankful for Jonathan, for what he does for me, for what he does for this church, for what he does for this community. And so I'm glad that he's able to get away and hopefully be able to refill his cup as he fills our cups up every week with his, with his knowledge, with his lessons, the way that he challenges us. And so I wanna challenge you right now. I challenge you to be praying for Jonathan in the next two weeks. I, I, I challenge you to be praying for his wife, Leslie, in the next two weeks. And so I'm so thankful for him. And so if you would right now, uh, pause with me and let's pray for Jonathan. Let's pray for his wife and let's pray for his family uh, as he's able to get away and prepare for us as well. Let's pray. God, we just want to come to you now. We are so thankful for Pleasant Valley, for this great family uh, that you have given to us. God, we hope that we are honoring you in not only the things that we say, but the, but the things that we do. God, we know that this is a very difficult time right now, uh, that we miss each other, that we're trying to live day to day and figure out what's going on around us. And God, even though things around us are changing, God, we know that you never change. Help us to live in that peace and comfort uh, that only you can provide. God, right now we ask a special blessing on Jonathan. Thank you for what he does for all of us the way that he prepares uh, the lessons, the way that he lives out those examples for us, and God, the way that he sharpens us and is such a great encouragement for this community. Uh, we ask that you can watch over him during this two-week study break, uh, that you will feed him with the knowledge that he needs, and God, just give him a way to continue to communicate those things to us and challenge us. Be with his wife, Leslie. We know that she is a huge encouragement to him watch over her and bless her and watch over their their five great kids but just thank you for their family give them strength god and may jonathan be able to refill his cup this week it's in jesus name that we pray amen all right we're going to start off with a with a little game okay i don't know if you're watching right now maybe you're watching alone maybe you're watching with your family maybe you're watching with your tiny church i don't know but we're going to start off with a game and here's how we're going to do the game okay i want to show you two pictures on the screen and you have to tell me which one you think is better, okay? And when you say which one is better, you have to say it out loud. Whether you're alone or once again, tiny church or with your family, you have to say out loud which one you think is better. That way everybody knows where you stand, okay? So here we go, the first picture on the screen, which is better between these two, bacon or sausage? Are you a bacon person or are you a sausage person? And it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to just be for breakfast. We all know you can eat breakfast 24-7. So are you a bacon person or a sausage person? All right, number two. Are you a Ford or are you a Chevy person? Which one are you? And let me tell you, at any time, if you disagree with your tiny church or you disagree with your family or you're giving different answers, feel free to pause this video and discuss it out before we move forward. But are you a Ford person or a Chevy person? All right, number three winter or summer now i know listen i know it's easy for all of us right now to think oh i'm a winter person because it's 100 degrees outside and it's hot i get that but really clear your head and think do i really like being by a fireplace with it snowing or would i rather be outside when it's hot and jumping into a swimming pool so are you winter or summer number four the houston texans or the new england patriots and that one's probably pretty easy and pretty obvious. So let me change it real quick. Any NFL team versus the New England Patriots, which would you say? And if anybody at your house or your tiny church right now just said the Patriots, the next question you need to ask them is, are you even a Christian? How can you cheer for the Patriots? I'm kidding, Ron Throneberry. I'm kidding, Alex Shelton, kind of, just a little bit. And last but not least, I know this last question is really going to get everybody riled up and discussing. Which is better, LeBron James or Michael Jordan? Let the debate begin. Which one is the greatest of all time? Hopefully you're having fun with your family right now discussing that. But I want you to hang on to that game. Okay? Sausage or bacon? Ford or Chevy? Winter or summer? Any NFL team versus the Patriots? 
or LeBron or Jordan. Hang on to that game because we're going to come back to that here in just a little while. But right now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open those up to Genesis chapter 29. And we're going to flow into a, a very interesting story that will that we'll relate to the way that we just started this sermon. And when you open up to Genesis chapter 29, we read about this guy by the name of Isaac. And he's married to this lady named Rebecca. And they have two kids named Jacob and Esau. And these two boys are twins. And, and throughout their lifetime, they kind of, you know, battle and, and fight. And, and they're fighting over, you know, the, the birthright or the blessing of Isaac. But then one day comes when Isaac tells his son Jacob, hey, I want you to leave this land and I want you to, to go to a certain land. And he sent him to the place where his wife Rebekah grew up and where her family lived. And he said, hey, I instruct you to go to that land and I want you to find um, Laban's line, which is, her mother's, which is his mother's brother who lived in Haran. So I want you to go to that land. And so one day he, he did as he was told. And so he picked up and he's traveling. And he finally gets to this place and he finally comes to this well where he finds some shepherds giving water to their sheep. And he says, hey, where are you guys from? And they said, we're from Haran. And he's like, great. Do you, do you know Laban? Do you know Nahor's grandson? And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course we know him. And Jacob said, well, is he well? And they said, oh, yeah, he's well. Not only is he well, but here comes one of his daughters. Here comes Rachel. And in Genesis 29, 17, it tells us that Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful and that Jacob was in love with Rachel. And so I don't know about you, maybe it's just the way my mind works, but I can see in this scene when Jacob looks off and he sees Rachel coming, he sees Roger Rabbit from the old school movie, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? A lot of you who are older understand and remember this movie, but I can see Jacob's eyes popping out of his head like, wow. Or like that cartoon character who has his jaw drop, like, whoa, she is beautiful. And so he followed her home and got to meet Laban. And for a month, Jacob worked for Laban until finally one day Laban came to Jacob and said, look, just because you're a relative of mine, I mean, should you work for me for nothing? What do you want your wages to be? And right here, Jacob could have said anything. He could have said, man, I want more cattle. I want more sheep. You know, I'll work for you for this section of land or, or give me this place to live. I'll work for you just for food. I mean, he gave him all the options. And what do you think Jacob asked for? That's right, he asked for Rachel. He said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your daughter, Rachel. And Laban was like, hey, I guess it's better for her to be with you than some other man. Tell you what, stay here with me and work for seven years and I'll give you my daughter, Rachel. And so that was the deal. And so Jacob did. The scriptures tell us that he worked for seven years for Laban in order to marry Rachel. But according to scripture, those seven years only felt like a few days to him because he was in love. Oh, how sweet. But after seven years was up, Jacob went to Laban and said, all right, the time has come. Give me my wife. Give me Rachel. My time is complete. And so Laban brought all the people together in that place and he had a big feast. But when evening came, when evening came, he took his daughter Leah, not Rachel, who according to scripture wasn't as beautiful as Rachel. And he gave Jacob Leah in marriage, not Rachel. And do you know the crazy part of this story? Jacob didn't realize it until the next morning. He woke up the next morning and thought, whoa, whoa, this isn't Rachel. What has happened here? And so when you go to verse 25, this is what it says. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? And Laban replied, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the elder one. Finish this daughter's bridal week then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And so they agreed to another deal. He was like, all right, finish this bridal week with her and then I'll give you Rachel for seven more years of work. And Jacob agreed to it. He said, all right, that's what we'll do. And so that was their new deal on the table. And so from that point on, everything went smooth. Everything was great. It was rainbows and butterflies, wasn't it? Actually, that couldn't be further from the truth. That's wrong because from that point on, a huge battle began. And I don't mean battles like we read in the Old Testament between, you know, armies or soldiers. I mean a battle between two women. 
Now that's a battle, and this battle was to see which one could have the most babies. Because during this time, babies, especially sons, were it was the way that a woman could demonstrate her worth. And so let the competition begin. Okay, Leah started off this competition strong. It got out four to nothing. She had four boys by the name of Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then Rachel got upset. And she went to Jacob and she's like, well, why am I not having kids? And Jacob's like, well, how am I supposed to know? I'm not in the place of God. And so Rachel thought, well, I'll just show them. So she went and got her maidservant and gave her maidservant to Jacob. And Jacob was able to have kids through her. And Rachel, scriptures tell us, Rachel sat back and thought, okay, I've won. I've won the battle. But Leah wasn't going out without a fight. Matter of fact, she said, okay, well, I'll show you. I'll go get my maidservant. And she brought her maidservant to Jacob. And this battle went on back and forth, back and forth with each other until finally Rachel one day had Joseph and Benjamin and just, here we go. When it was all said and done, there were 13 kids. They had 12 boys and one girl. And when you read this story in Genesis 29 and 30 of, of Leah and Rachel and this battle going back and forth, trying to get Jacob's attention and trying to outdo each other, man, you see a lot of emotions. You see a lot of craziness going on. I wish I could ask you right now, I wish I was with your tiny church or, or your family and just ask you, what emotions do you see in this story? Because I can hear you giving me answers that would be something to the effect of, man, we see a lot of jealousy in this story. We see a lot of anger between the sisters. We see a lot of resentment or hate. And you'd be correct in saying all those things. We also see a lot of sadness. You know, with, with Leah, we see where she's trying to really cry out for help. She's, cr she's crying out for some type of attention. She wants somebody to notice her. Matter of fact, after she had Reuben, the scriptures tell us that she said, now my husband will love me. After she had Simeon, she was crying out, at least now maybe, maybe my husband will listen to me. After she had Levi, she said, now Jacob will be attached to me. And so all this time, she's trying to get Jacob's attention. And so Leah is struggling. She's trying, once again, to get somebody to notice her. But it's not like Rachel was doing any better. Rachel, too, had anger. She had jealousy. She was resentful because she was seeing that her sister was able to have kids, but she wasn't. And so why? Why is this the case? Where, do, where are all these emotions coming from? Why all the, the anger? Why all the hate? Why all the jealousy? What's the common denominator that is bringing all of these things, these emotions to the surface? Believe it or not, it's a common denominator that you struggle with today. It's one that I struggle with. It's something that we all do that brings all of those negative emotions out in our life. It's something that we don't talk about enough in church. Matter of fact, it's this common denominator that makes a lot of us act like Leah and makes us act like Rachel. And I want you to hang on to that thought. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. You know, years ago, I was able to teach a class called Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. And I got to teach this class with Randy Wood and Curtis Eubanks. And man, it was a fun class. And one day we got to the section where Jesus was telling us not to worry and do different things. And so we came across all of these worries and fears that we have. And over time, our worries and fears change as we become older. You know, it's in the study, it told us that when we're age two to four, you know, we have this worry or, or fear of the dark, you know, about sleeping alone or shadows. Ages two and four have a fear of the potty. Maybe they think it's gonna eat them, I don't know. But then when they, they transition into the next age group, they, they start worrying about different things. Not so much the potty anymore, but they're worried about bad guys or, or shots or bugs. And then they transition into more worries. Throwing up at school is a worry between eight and 11 year olds. And I get it, I understand. And then when they move into their teenage years, guess what? Throwing up in school is still there. And so if you're out there and you're one of those people that was worried about that and it actually happened, I'm sorry. Man, I'm sorry, hopefully you're able to have gotten over that by now. But in your teenage years, you're worried about making good grades or you know, how do you look or can you be accepted or liked? And then you move into college and your fears change. You're no longer afraid of the potty in college, but you are worried about money 
You know, you're worried about paying bills. You're like, wait a minute, my parents aren't giving me money anymore. They're not paying my bills. I've got to do that myself. Like, are you kidding me? And you're worried about your job and your career. And then you transition into what we would call your adulthood. And you worry about job security. You worry about your kids and their health and your health. But do you know one of the top worries that adults have today, one of the top fears that we have? Am I good enough? Am I good enough? We look back at our life and think, have I done enough? Or am I worthy of this? Or am I valued? Am I good enough? Which takes us back to the story in Genesis 29 with Leah and with Rachel. Was there jealousy? Absolutely. Was there anger and resentment and hate? All through this story there is. But what's the common denominator that once again brings all of these emotions to the surface? It's something that we all struggle with today. And the common denominator is comparison. It's comparison. This story of Leah and Rachel is a story about comparison. And this comparison game makes, makes both of them ask the question at some point, am I good enough? Because Leah is looking at Rachel thinking, well, I don't look like her. I'm not as pretty as she is. Am I good enough? But then it's making Rachel look at Leah and say the same things. Am I good enough because I'm not able to have kids like she's able to have kids? And so they're constantly worried about, are they good enough? And we see this all throughout Scripture. If you have your Bible, mark these down and study them later. We see the comparison game going in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and with Abel. Which one's going to give the better gift? We see where they both bring their gifts before the Lord and one was accepted and one wasn't. And that brings anger with Cain to the point where he takes his life. That's due to comparison. We see in Genesis chapter 25 this, this comparison game with Jacob and Esau. Their whole life, they're battling between which one is better. Not only are they battling, but their parents, Isaac and Rebekah, are kind of pinning them against each other. You know, one likes to work the field and, and one of them likes to stay home and cook and they're, they're fighting over the, this birthright and blessing. Which one is better? You know, we see it in 1 Samuel 19 with King Saul and David. Which one of these is going to get the most praise? You know, they come home from a battle and the crowds are cheering that, that King Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. And man, that angers King Saul. Like, how are they giving him more credit than they're giving me? It's this comparison. We see it in Luke chapter 10 with Mary and Martha. You know, here's Jesus and Mary is at the, at the feet of Jesus taking care of him and Martha's up working going, look at me, look what I'm doing. I mean, she's over there being lazy. Look at me, Jesus. I'm doing more than she's doing. It's a comparison game. We even see it with the apostles of Jesus, don't we? In Luke chapter 9, when they come to Jesus and say, who is the greatest? Like, which one of us, Jesus, is going to have what post of honor? How much, of, you know, I mean, how much money are we going to make when this new kingdom starts? And so it's constantly this comparison game. In other words, what they're all asking in these stories between Cain and Abel and Jacob and Esau and Leah and Rachel and King Saul and David and Mary and Martha and so many others in the Bible, you know what they're really asking? Who is better? I want to know who is better. And do you know who else struggles with the game, the comparison game of who is better? I do. I struggle every day with this game. And I'd be willing to say that many of you watching right now at home, if you could admit it, you struggle with this too. Truth is, I can relate to the loneliness that Leah felt. I can relate to the jealousy that Rachel had. I can relate and understand the hate that Cain had in his heart for Abel. I can understand the anger that King Saul had towards David because he was getting more praise than he was. It was almost like he had been forgotten. He was invisible when David was around. I can understand the resentment that, that Martha had for Mary. Look at me, I'm doing more work than these people. Recognize me, give me the attention. I can understand the competition and the, and the selfishness of Jacob and of Esau. I can understand this. Why? Why can I understand this? Why can I relate to all of those people and maybe you can too? Why do I understand? It's because too many times in my life, if I'm being honest with you this morning, I'm looking out. I'm looking right here and I'm comparing myself with other people. I'm seeing what other people are doing. 
Oh, what are they accomplishing? What are they up to? And I feel like I have to be doing the same thing. So I'm constantly looking out when all along I should be looking up. Because when I'm looking out, I'm deceiving myself into believing that I'm not worthy, that I'm not valuable. But when I'm looking up, I'm constantly reminded that I am valuable, that I am worthy, that I do have a purpose in this life. And you know what? We don't only compare ourselves with other people, do we? I mean, we compare other people with other people. We compare our friends to other people's friends. We compare our kids to other people's kids. You know, we're like, oh, what are their kids accomplishing? Come on, kids, you got to pick it up. You, we we got to get with them. We compare even strangers to strangers at times. People we don't even know, we could be like, oh, look at them and look at them. And we start to compare. And comparison isn't obviously anything new. I mean, we just read in Scripture of all these stories of comparison. It, it's nothing new. But I would be willing to say that it's something that has escalated in the past years due to the Internet due to social media. Now listen, I'm not one that's gonna stand here this morning and say, ooh, the internet is of the devil or social media is bad. I don't believe that. I mean, I think getting on the internet and being able to catch up with my friends from high school or college or families or seeing what's going on in your lives and how I could be praying for you, I think all of those are positive things. But it also can turn to something negative real quick if you're not careful. And statistics show that people who get on social media and they're not careful, Statistics show this, and you'll see it on the screen, that rates of anxiety and depression have increased by 70% in the past 25 years. That 60% of people using social media reported that it has impacted their self-esteem in a negative way. That 50% reported social media having negative effects on their relationships. That 80% reported that it's easier to be deceived by others through their sharing on social media. And that one in three people, when they get on the internet or on social media, leave more depressed than when they got on. And so once again, you think, why is this the case? Why? Because it starts out innocent. It starts out, hey, I just want to check on people, see what's going on. But real quickly, all of us turn it into a comparison game. We start to compare our lives to other people's lives. And in reality, what we do is we see our full life with our flaws and mistakes and struggles and temptations, and we put that out there against people's highlight reels. People are on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it may be, and it's their highlight reel. It's the best of the best of their life, and we think, wow, they've got it all together. Man, they're doing things right. Look at them. And then we look at our life and go, that's not me. I'm not doing all those things. And so it brings us down a little bit. Because once again, it's this comparison game that's not fair. We've got to stop playing the comparison game. We don't just do this with social media. I mean, it's everywhere. It's on, on TV. It's on, it's on our shows. We compare ourselves with uh, you know, certain famous people. We do it through magazines, sports. We do it through certain music. You know, In the world today, girls, they're going to tell you that you have to look a certain way. You have to have a certain figure. And if you don't, then... Man, you're just not as valuable. You're not as worthy. That couldn't be further from the truth. Men, the world's going to tell you that you have to have it all together. That you have to be a certain way and you got to be manly. And whatever you do, don't ask for directions. False. That's not true. When we begin playing this comparison game, we get into the same feelings and the same emotions and we have the same results as Cain did. We have the same emotions and feelings as, as King Saul or Leah, or Martha, and so on and so forth. We become discontent. We become restless. We become ashamed. We start desiring the wrong things. You know, Teddy Roosevelt once said, comparison is the thief of joy. Man, isn't that the truth? Because comparison takes away our sense of gratitude. When we start to compare, we forget what we have. We forget what God has given us. When we start to compare, it takes away our happiness. We stop looking at all the things around us that should bring me joy, the blessings that I have, and I start comparing it to other people. Comparison takes away my focus. Why am I really here right now? Why am I breathing? And that's to serve the Lord and to give Him my very best. But it takes away that focus when I start looking out instead of start looking up. We begin to believe the lies that I'm not worthy. I'm not valuable. I am a nobody. 
When we start comparing, we fall into the trap and the fear that many adults fear today. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough, which is crazy to me because that's not what this says. This tells us different. This tells us in Genesis 1, that God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. God created you just the way he wanted you. You look the way you do because God created you that way. You have the talents that you have because God wanted you to have those talents. This right here tells me in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God did not make a mistake with you. God did not make a mistake with me. And so let me go back to the game that we started out in the beginning. Which is better? And this time I'm not talking about bacon or sausage. I'm not talking about winter or summer, LeBron or Jordan. That's not what I'm talking about. Which is better? Let me ask you these questions. Which is better between Cain and Abel? Which is better between Leah and Rachel? Which is better, King Saul or David? Who is better, Mary or Martha? And those are trick questions because you can't compare people to other people because different people have different talents. Different people have different purposes. You can't compare each other to each other. You can't do it. And in the scriptures, when we read about these stories, the good news is that, that God had a purpose for all of their lives. But the bad news is that many of them didn't see it or fulfill it because they were too busy looking out instead of looking up. If you were to be honest this morning, what about you? Are you too busy looking out? Are you, are you looking up? Because as long as we're looking out and we're comparing ourselves with others, we'll always believe the lie that we're not good enough. We'll never be good enough as long as we're looking out. But if we can train ourselves and remind ourselves to look up, we'll be reminded of the truth that you are good enough because God created you that way. And if you need prayers right now, maybe, maybe this has hit home with you. You understand I am in, an, in a comparison game. I've got to change. I've got to stop looking out and start looking up again. We have people right here on the screen that would love to pray with you, that would love to talk with you. And maybe it's not about this lesson. Maybe you have a joy in your life that you would like to share. Maybe it's something going on in your life right now that you're struggling with or a family member is struggling with or you, know, you want to pray for somebody to come to the truth and, and come into a relationship with Jesus. These people on the screen would love to pray with you. Please contact them at some point today or throughout the week. And in closing, I'll say this. Leah lived her life in misery. Man, in shame and a lot of times in depression. I'm sure at some point she was in question of why I'm even here, what's my purpose? In large part, she was having all of these feelings because she was in constant comparison with her sister, Rachel. And many of us today feel like Leah. Why? I mean, maybe it's because we think we're not pretty enough. Maybe we feel like Leah because we don't have a great job or we don't think we have a job. Or maybe we don't have a job at all and so we think, well, I'm not worthy. You know, a lot of us feel like Leah this morning because maybe we believe we have different struggles or temptations than somebody else. Or maybe it's because, you know, our marriage isn't great or our kids are struggling or whatever that may be. Maybe a lot of us this morning can relate to Leah because, you know, our life didn't end up where we thought it would. You know, all the dreams that we had as kids, man, we just weren't able to fulfill those. But little did Leah know that through her son Judah, who would come later, would one day come someone by the name of King David. And through King David, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Leah may not have seen her worth or value because she was constantly comparing herself with Rachel, but God was always at work with her, always at work. He always had a purpose for her life. And guess what? He has a purpose for your life too. And he has a purpose for mine. Stop looking out and comparing yourself with other people, but live out the life and the purpose that God has for you. You are valuable and you have worth. Once again, we want to thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for listening to this message. Once again, be praying for Jonathan. Uh, be praying for Leslie and their family. Pleasant Valley, we want you to know that we miss you. Man, we wish and hope that we can get together with you soon and be able to see you face to face. But you, uh, you have to understand, our elders love you more than you could ever imagine. They are in constant prayer for this place. They're constant prayer for you. 
and safety is a top priority for them right now. And so when that day comes when we're back together, it will be a celebration. But until then, know that you are missed and we can't wait to see you soon. But as you go on throughout this week and as you attack this week and give God the glory, I challenge all of you to stop looking out and comparing yourself to the purpose that God has for other people, but see your purpose. This week, I challenge you to look up and be reminded that He created you just the way that you are, and He has big plans for your life. Go in peace. Oh,